Okay, thank you very much. So I'm gonna talk about competition in media markets, and the reason is uh, I don't think we actually understand, this is going to be a theory paper, and the reason is I, we don't actually fully understand how competition works in this market. And I'm gonna spell out uh, competition in a particular way throughout the paper. I'm gonna be thinking about entry in this media market, and I'm gonna be contrasting duopoly and monopoly outcomes in this familiar kind of settings in which you have um, uh, content is for free uh, for consumers. Consumers dislike ads and you will have two platforms which will have to choose um, how much advertising to supply. I'm gonna argue in a second that there is uh, an answer out there uh, to this question, uh, which is prior literature says that, well, if competition goes up, then we should expect advertising to go down. But I'm also gonna argue that this negative relationship between competition and the amount of ads is just not there in the data. And that this uh, theory models, they rely on a specific assumption, which is that consumers choose only one uh, media outlet. So what I'm gonna do, I'm just gonna allow consumers, I'm gonna tell you in a second, that I'm gonna allow consumers to consume more than one media outlet, as simple as that, and show you that things change basically substantially, okay? Now, when, I, when we think about this paper, really, uh, what we have in mind, it's a very broad kind of uh, setup in which you could think about competition between these online advertising networks, such as the Google or the Facebook display network. Now these, you know, are these large um, platforms which supply advertising opportunities on many, many websites. But the way, you know, I feel a little bit more comfortable thinking about competition between traditional uh, broadcasting stations such as CNN and, and MSNBC. Now, of course we're not the first to tackle this question, so there is a lot of people who wrote papers about competition, uh, many of which are sitting in this room, uh, and in a sense there is a, um, an equally sort of large set of papers that use models uh, suited for this purpose to explore sort of additional possibly much more interesting questions um, in uh, this domain, okay? Now, a common theme there, when you want to think about advertising, uh, is you could think about ads as being some sort of shadow price, if you want, that consumers, all of us, would have to pay in order to satisfy our content needs, right? I mean, we know that under fairly broad conditions, competition tends to lower prices, so you would conjecture, well, you know, if there is an extra firm, then there's gonna be less ads. Okay. Now, this sort of intuition is known as this competitive, but to many of you, I guess, as this competitive bottleneck argument, um, and has been captured uh, by um, these very influential papers, theory papers, in a sense. So let me walk you through their logic, as this is something I think it's useful to refer to for the rest of the talk. So what these guys do, uh, they deploy a very simple model in which you have a bunch of advertisers, a bunch of broadcasters, and a bunch of viewers, okay? Now, viewers dislike ads in the sense that they would rather get advertising-free content, okay? Advertisers instead like ads in the sense that conditional on having a captive set of these viewers, they would want to send them as many advertising messages as possible. And these two platforms, they have to decide how many ads they want to feature in their program, right? Now, in this model, viewers, they have idiosyncratic preferences for these broadcasters, okay? But they choose only one, the one they like the most. Now, what this means is that these broadcasters, when they go talk to the advertisers, they could actually insist on them paying the monopoly price for accessing their own exclusive consumer's attention, right? So what this means is that in this model, competition is all about getting these very, very valuable viewers on board and this is exactly what injects downward pressure in equilibrium, okay? One way of getting these viewers on board is to increase the quality of, of your content or maybe decrease the amount of ads, okay? Now, lot, lots of people think, you know, there is really little descriptive power there. I mean, there are many, many markets which you would think as being fairly competitive, but, you know, in which there are lots of ads, right? And lots of people also think that, you know, this model sort of fails to account for this public policy debate that you have uh, mostly in Europe about advertising bans or caps. Now, private broadcasters, they tend to oppose the lifting of these bans, but so this kind of doesn't make any sense. I mean, the public broadcasters, they're really, really tough competitors, 
precisely because they're getting subsidized. So they, they can do without this really annoying us, right? And in my view, uh, this model sort of fails to capture uh, one of the characterizing features of these new media, in a sense, of the internet. Like any paper that I know that talks about the internet will have to tell you why is this online world any offline world at some point. And many content that, you know, online, in online, a characterizing feature of user behavior is that they tend to spread their attention over a much wider array of outlets. And so this table is trying to make this very simple point. So this is data from Comscore uh, from December to the, for the month of December 2012. So Comscore media metrics records 221 million unique US consumers in that month, okay? And what they find by monitoring these people is that 94% of them, they visit frequently, okay? On a monthly basis, Google that belong, so, sorry, websites that belong to the Google Advertising Network. 89.5 of them, percent of them, they visit websites that belong to the second largest network. Yahoo can deliver 83 of them. Punchline, there is really a lot of overlap there, and we haven't really studied this, the effect of this overlap. So this is what we do, okay? And what, in this model, we're going to allow people to choose multiple platforms. There's just going to be two in the baseline case. And in this model, um, there's going to be concerns by the platforms about the composition of their customer base. So let me try to give up the intuition in two slides by using this kind of Fox News puzzle as an illustrative example. Okay? So 1996, we know from yesterday's talk, you know, it's a big news. Uh, it's a big year for cable news because you know Fox News started broadcasting. And there is an actual evidence there that CNN and uh, MSNBC, they reacted to this by increasing the number of minutes of ads that were featured in their programming. Now we do actually go back to the data and we check um, whether this is sitting there. And I can tell you that yes, on average, an extra entrant is going to cause an increase um, of in the range of 4 or 5% of the minutes of advertising of uh, the incumbents. Okay. Now, simple model. Suppose there is a monopolist, and this monopolist is MSNBC, and MSNBC has a liberal bias. Okay? This is going to play a role later on. There is just one advertiser and a bunch of viewers. Okay? Now, ads are a nuisance to viewers in the sense that there is a demand, little d, um, that is negatively slow, okay? So one more ad means that less viewers are gonna watch MSNBC. Advertising is informative, and let's just assume, for this simple example, that if I inform one viewer about the existence of this product, then this is worth to me $1 in advertising revenues, okay? How do I inform viewers of the existence of products? Well, there's gonna be a technology, okay? And this is going to be summarized by this phi function here. Okay, phi 1 of n1 is the probability that a given viewer of MSNBC is informed. Okay, so the more advertising messages there are, the higher the probability that this viewer is going to be informed. So what MSNBC does here is going to maximize this objective function, $1 times the number of viewers times the probability that any given viewer is informed. So the trade-off here, okay, if MSNBC issues an extra ad is really trading off viewers because some of them will switch off with a higher probability of informing them. Okay? And any theory model about advertising is going to have a version of this trade off right here, okay? in which ad quantities play a role. Suppose now Fox News comes in. Fox News is a conservative bias. Now, what that means is that we're, you know, we're thinking about a world in which if you're likely to watch Fox, if I see you watch Fox, I can infer that you are unlikely to watch MSNBC and vice versa. So we're looking at a very polarized world in this example. Okay. Now, suppose this is the exercise. Fox News comes in and does whatever MSNBC was doing. Okay. It's supplying the exact same minutes. Can this be an equilibrium of a simple game in which these guys are choosing quantities simultaneously? Okay, now we're thinking about duopoly. Okay, 
Now, these two things are gonna be true in my model. Conditional on entry, MSNBC viewers are gonna split in two different subsets. Let's call the first one the news junkies, and the second one the liberals. Okay, news junkies are gonna consume both, and liberals are gonna consume only MSNBC. Now, because of this parallelization, what's gonna happen is that the bulk of MSNBC viewers is gonna be made of, composed of liberals, okay? And instead, most people at the margins are these news junkies right here. A second, very straightforward, in a sense, feature of the model is that whereas informing liberals is still worth $1 in advertising revenues, informing these news junkies is gonna be worth less than $1. Well, why is that? Well, these news junkies now, they're catered by two different outlets. And so, in a sense, some of the rents associated with informing them are going to be competed away in some way, okay, in my model. So what this means is that you're basically changing the trade-off here. So once entry occurs, what happens is that if MSNBC issues an extra ad, we're thinking about deviations now, is really giving up news junkies, which are not very valuable, in exchange for a higher probability of informing uh, these liberals. Okay, so that's still very valuable, which means that in this example, there's going to be upward pressure, okay? Now, there's lots of stuff in here. I'm, I'm gonna spell that out during the presentation, but I mean, I guess that the punchline in a sense is that here, this is really a paper about relative composition of audiences, okay? And I was thinking the other day, like, you know, for a crowd like this, which kind of questions uh, you would be able to address um, using this kind of logic. So here there is a model in which after entry, both Fox News and MSNBC start serving, they drop these news junkies and they start serving these you know, liberals and conservative. Now if you apply the usual Spence logic, we don't do this in a paper, but this is basically a theory of media bias, right? I mean, you could easily get a model in which media bias is induced by these two features, which is very different than the kind of theories of media bias uh, that uh, are out there. Okay. So um, I'm gonna divide this paper in two bits. Um, the first part is really, really simple. I mean, the first part, I'm just gonna characterize the marginal incentives to supply ads before and after entry. This you could do really by inspection. I mean, you have a bunch of first order condition, you spell them out, and I'm just gonna interpret them for you. The second part is kind of more involved because then you see, oh gee, there are all these new effects, but what am I really learning? Can I add structure to the model in a way that tells me under which circumstances I should expect some market outcomes vis-a-vis -vis others? And that is going to be more involved in a sense on all levels, okay? But you know, the real message is just the idea and this extra effect here. There's gonna be application. I'm gonna talk about content and endogenizing preferences. I'm gonna talk about policy issues. Possibly I'm gonna talk about screening, um, a more sophisticated version of this trade-off. Um, and we do have an empirical section. It is super, super cool, but I really thought that the way, the way I could sell this to this audience was just not to talk about it, okay? So just trust me, it is super cool. Okay, okay. Um, okay, so there's lots of stuff in there. Um, I think we're basically adding to four different literature here. Um, these are the guys who are interested in platforms. This is one of the few serious models uh, that models multi-oming, for those of you familiar with this literature. Um, there are other guys, including Simon Anderson, who are looking at how things change in media when you allow for multi-oming. Um, this paper is really complementary to ours in the sense that they just disregard incentives at the margin, okay? So they make assumptions such that, you know, the quantities don't play any role in their models, and they focus more, in a sense, on content. But, I mean, I can tell you, we, in a sense, uh, there is a sense in which we can tell more than they do uh, when it comes to content choice, okay? Precisely because we can tell how content choice affects uh, the strategic incentive in this setting. I'm working with Susan on a super cool paper, Susan and Joshua, and in this paper, uh, it's related in a sense, there's gonna be uh, multi-yoming consumers, but that's a paper in which, um, yes, platforms have concerns about the composition as well, uh, but that's a paper in which we try to understand 
um, answer the question, if you have to, if you have concerns about multi-yoming or composition, um, which kind of website do you have to uh, supply in order to maximize revenue, okay? We're also speaking to these guys, and this is a very long list, okay? Uh, let's see what you think. I'm really curious to see what you think when we get to the diversity uh, section. And then um, there is lots of people, of course, in the empirics. We saw a paper yesterday, many papers yesterday, actually. Now, my question for you guys is, you know, which kind of, you know, one thing I would like to understand is which kind of questions are more sen sensitive to the assumption that, you know, your viewers have to choose uh, one and only one. Uh, stage. Okay, so maybe you could tell me something about that, or we can discuss towards the end. Okay, so two platforms. That's the model I'm going to present today. One advertiser, known valuation. That's the simplest possible thing that I can present, and a bunch of heterogeneous consumers. Let's describe first preferences. So, given the amount of ads, how do consumers sort onto platforms? Then let's describe the technology. Given the amount of ads and given what consumers do, what is the advertising surplus? And then let's describe how the surplus gets divided. Okay, preferences. Here's the assumption, okay? So we are assuming that um, we're in a setting in which a type is a point on the plane, okay? So there is B-dimensional heterogeneity here. Now Q1 is really the valuation of this type for uh, viewing uh, platform one, okay? And so the choice rule we are imposing for these viewers is that viewer of type Q1, Q2 is gonna consume platform I if and only if QI is larger than the disutility is getting from us. Okay, so given this choice rule here, my conditional on entry, my consumers are gonna split into four different subsets, okay? Those who consume both, there are two large numbers here, those who were exclusive of platform one, and those who are exclusive of platform two. Okay. Now, what we're actually assuming here is that the total amount, total demand, please keep in mind that little d is the total demand of platform I, which decomposes in the number of exclusive guys and the number of overlapping one, is independent of what my rival is doing. Okay. So we're making this very, very strong assumption here. Um, another way of saying this is that choices over one and two are separable. Platforms are assumed to be neither substitutes nor complements. And you know, I learned how to spell it out in many different ways. Okay, but that's essentially the assumption. Okay. Why do we assume independence then? You know, when I started thinking about this, the idea was, why don't we write a model that sort of follows the footsteps of all the other models, but departs, you know, radically in one dimension? Just you know, think about a clear theoretical benchmark. I mean, these guys, in the either or literature, they assume that you could consume either one thing or the other. That's basically assuming mutual exclusivity or perfect substitutability in a sense. How do you move away from that? Well, by assuming independence as much as possible. And so the idea is, well, of course, I mean, you could think then of you know, any convex combination of this either or and what we call this either both model in terms of applications, right? So, um, but here, you, you know, I really think about this as being a theoretical benchmark in a sense. It is true that there are applications, right? I mean, think about what your choice of doing Facebook has to do or to say with your choice of electing Yelp as your supplier of restaurant reviews. I contend that these are really two different choices. And um, as a matter of fact, these are among the largest websites and they belong to two different advertising networks, okay? So, you know, there are, you know, possible applications that would match exactly this assumption of independence, but I do not want to sell you the assumption, okay? Just think about this as being one way to capture new things. Now, one thing that is really frustrating is that many times when I present this paper, people tend to confuse conditional independence to, with unconditional or statistical independence, right? I mean, my model still allows tastes to be correlated. Okay, so later on, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna specialize to a parametrization in which um, this Q1, Q2 are gonna be distributed according to a normal distribution. So these are my guys here, 
So this is uh, just a um, contour set of a normal distribution, which is parameterized by a co correlation coefficient. So this is the case in which correlation is negative. Okay. Just to familiarize with this diagram. Okay. So given n1, okay, this is the set of all consumers who would choose to consume platform one. These are all the inframarginal guys. This is little d1 if you want. And this is the set of all marginal consumers of platform one. And the same holds for platform two. Now here, I'm just, you know, you know, it's reasonable to assume that, you know, in the case of MSNBC and Fox News, you would expect a neg negative correlation of tasters. In sports, correlation is positive. Facebook, Yelp, I don't know. You guys help me out. I was just making this up. Okay. Okay. Now, again, just to remark what we just said, you could use the same diagram to depict the monopoly situation. So that's the case in which, say, the monopoly situation is a situation in which n2 is equal to infinity. These two things are equivalent. So the monopolist consumer will be these guys here. Conditional on entry, this is the kind of decomposition we're talking about. OK. Again, as Jesse was saying, just pure composition effect. Now let's move to the advertiser surplus. The key assumption here is really diminishing marginal returns from advertising. That's, that's key. How do you read diminishing marginal returns in this setting? It captures the idea that you know ads are valuable in a sense that if I, ish, if I send an extra advertising message to consumer that is going to be valuable, but less so with the number of messages already sold, okay? And this has to do with duplication, right? I mean, if you think about advertising as some stochastic process, with some probability, the next message is going to inform a consumer which I already informed. And this is the usual way to justify this diminishing return. Okay. So diminishing returns and duplication are the same thing in this paper. Now, suppose that consumers are fixed. Okay, In equilibrium, that's not the case. But here we are describing the advertiser's preferences. So suppose they're fixed. Now, their surplus is assumed to be $1 times a little number here, which is a fraction in 0, 1, which tells me what is the expected fraction of the population that I'm reaching when I'm sending n1 messages, n2 messages. Okay. Now, you can, without loss of generality, decompose this fraction into the what is called the subreach into these three subsets of consumers. Right. So the total number of people I'm getting with this amount of ads is equal to the total number of people that I'm getting exclusive that I'm getting from one, plus the total number of exclusive people that I'm getting on two, plus the total number of overlapping people that I'm getting from one and two. Okay. So I need three different phi functions. Again, this phi is the probability that a given exclusive consumer of one is informed. And then I need an extra phi one two function, which accounts for the fact that some of these people are getting messages from two sources. Now these phi functions are increasing, concave, diminishing marginal returns, and a phi one two function has a negative cross function. Okay, so an extra message on Fox has a um, the value of an extra message on Fox decreases with the number of messages I send uh, on MSNBC. Okay. So this is basically a simple um, three-stage game. Okay. So at stage one, there is the quantity choice. Okay. That's the total amount of ads. At stage two, we're going to allocate this total amount of ads. Right. So here, we assume that these platforms are going to post a public offer. A public offer is just a pair of real numbers. So you have to give me ti dollars in exchange for uh, MI advertising messages. Now this is the simple in the simplest version, right? MI, the total messages that I'm selling to this one advertiser is going to equal to NI. But of course, I mean, in the extension, we're going to allow for these platforms to post screening contracts, right? So you will have to, to post um, schedules, price schedules, right? You will have to pay me something if you buy two, something if you buy three, and so on and so forth. And then you just impose that the total number of ads should add up to n. Okay. And then 
um, at the last stage, advertisers are going to look at these posted contracts. They will have to decide whether they want to accept one, the other, both or none. And the same for consumers, as we discussed before. Now, in the case of a monopoly, you know, this really simplifies in the obvious way. Okay? So monopolist is going to post one contract, it's going to choose one quantity, and so on and so forth. This is a linear, quasi-linear environment, uh, very standard. This, you know, I'm going to assume that platforms care also just uh, about transfers, no costs. Um, this is just a shortcut for saying U of N10 is just a shortcut for saying that this particular advertiser accepted only the offer of one and rejected the offer of zero, and the reservation utilities are set uh, equal to zero for all players. I really hope that the model went through. And so let's try to solve it. Um, so in the monopoly case, guys, it's really, really simple, right? There's going to be a simple equilibrium in which my MSNBC posts a quantity of ads, is going to extract the entire advertising surplus with a price, and um, which means that the quantity that it's choosing is really maximizing the total advertising surplus here. Okay? So full surplus extraction in a monopoly case. So that's the punchline of this slide. Okay. Now in a duopoly case, things change. Okay. Even in this simple example. Now what happens is that in any sub-game perfect equilibrium, of course the advertisers are going to accept both offers. Right? If that's not the case, then one of the two platforms should lower its price. But then the maximum amount of money that they can hope to extract from this single advertiser is just bounded to the value they can deliver in excess to what their rival can do. Okay, that's right. What is this value in excess? Well, it's going to be the full value of those exclusive guys plus this term here, which captures the idea that by sending an extra N1 messages in this case, and I messages in this case, you're going to increase the probability of reaching those guys in common. Okay? So you can basically get paid for the last NI ads on those overlapping guys. Okay? So both platforms will claim in equilibrium the incremental surplus. Again, how much value they can deliver in excess of what the rival can deliver. Okay. Uh, what this means is that in this model, the quantities in duopoly are going to maximize this incremental surplus here. Okay. And another big, big implication is that rents are shared here. Okay. So the advertiser is going to keep is going to be able to keep some of some of its surplus. Okay. Okay. So this is a set. This is the sense in which even in the simple models, the price of ads drops because of duplication, because of multi -yon. Okay. Now the big question now is what about quantities? We know that prices drop, what about quantities? Okay, so one simple trick is to, you know, I'm, I'm going to write these two problems in a very similar way in the sense that you can always rewrite the payoff of the duopolis as the total payoff plus a correction term, which is accounting for this overlap. Okay. So this term here is basically discounting this total payoff because of diminishing returns, or duplication, if you wish. Okay. Now, this is an interesting object because, you know, since I didn't make any assumption, it's basically capturing, maybe we're going back to the point we were making before, but there, it's capturing two things at the same time. It's capturing duplication in a sense, but it's also capturing some sort of heterogeneity across these behavioral types. I mean, it could be that for some reason those who watch both channels are, you know, can be reached uh, with a different technology in a sense. Okay. So one way to sterilize this heterogeneity is to assume that phi one two, okay, is equal to one minus the probability that I'm missing them on both outlets. Okay. So if you make this assumption here, then the, this expression really simplifies in a very intuitive way. The payoff of the duopolist is going to be the total surplus, what it was getting before entry, minus 
the expected number of viewers that the rival can gather. Okay. Is that okay? Now, phi one, phi two is just you know the probability that a given overlapping viewers is getting two ads, is getting informed, sorry, twice. Okay, so this is, in a, in a sense, makes duplication more apparent. Okay. So here are the, the first order conditions. So the first part is the exact trade-off we were discussing before. You give up viewers, you increase probability, and what about this correction term? So let me spell that out for you in two slides. So um, our first issue is that after entry, the composition of the inframarginal set will change, okay? So before entry, you were sending N1 messages to all of these guys. Now, after entry, these guys here, they're gonna get twice the amount of ads that they were getting before, right? So what this means is that part of your viewers, you know, you're really hitting the flat spot of the curve, which means that the average marginal return goes down, and all other things being equal, this, all of these ads will induce you to reduce the amount of advertising, okay? So simple as that. Now what's um, a little bit less obvious is that after entry, there's also a composition effect on the marginal set, which we discussed before. Now before entry, these are the guys you were losing if you were to issue an extra ad. Now after entry, you're going to lose the exact same amount of guys, but now you're gonna distinguish between these two subsets, okay? And this is the kind of source of variation that you really don't care about, or that you care relatively less about. Okay. Because now part of that variation is less valuable to you, this means that you're more less resistant to quantity increases, right? Those are the news junkies. Before I was getting one dollar, now I'm not getting one dollar, so you know whatever, and you increase the amount of ads. So that sort of goes in the opposite direction. And then the question is, you know, when is it that one effect prevails over the other? So in what follows, I'm gonna say that there's gonna be, in, in, in terms of a comparative statics exercise, there's gonna be a more, if a parameter changes, I'm gonna say that the inframarginal composition is more averse if this, quantity here goes up at the, expense of the, of, at the expense of this quantity here. And then I'm gonna say that the marginal composition is more averse if instead, when this parameter changes, more of my variation is coming from the very valuable people. Okay, so we have a full character, so we can solve this exercise, so we get a full characterization. So here, we, a monopolist so the incumbent monopolies that level increases if and only if this inequality here is satisfied, okay? So this inequality is basically separating the two different channels through which you can get upward or downward pressure in this model. The left-hand side, it's really about the relative variation. So this is really about preferences. And this instead, it's about the relative reach probability. So this is about technology. Elasticity, sorry guys. So this is all in terms of elasticities of demand and of the elasticities of these, uh, let's call them uh, production functions or communication technologies, the elasticities of the feed. So this is all very general. These are actual empirical objects. You can think about you know, estimating uh, these things. You know, there is predict, yeah, so this is the elasticity of the overlapping viewers to, uh, you know, yes to an increase in the quantity of ads. This is the elasticity of the total amount of viewers, okay? So this is kind of the relative elasticity, okay? In a sense, this is capturing this idea that if there is more variation coming from these guys, then this is makes it more likely that you won't increase, right? If there is more variation from news junkies, then these other things are constant, make it more likely that you want to increase, that you end up with an equilibrium with more ads, okay? Okay, now competition here lowers profits, but for a very different reason than in the either or model, in the traditional model. In the traditional model, you die of no ads. Okay, if consumers are very sensitive to ads in the limits, you cannot issue any ads, you don't get any revenues, and you die. 
So in this model, competition lowers profits for a very different reason, but if you want it very intuitive, here you basically drawn in a, in a, right? In a sense, too many ads, and if this inequality is satisfied, then this issue is going to be exacerbated. Okay, so that's why profits are going down here. Now, another interesting feature about this inequality is that if you look at it, there is just one item that depends on the joint distribution of tastes that I showed you before, which is this elasticity here. Okay. So anything that, you know, for a given marginal distribution, anything that changes the joint distribution is going to affect just this term over here. So there is hope that we can gain traction understanding, you know, what is it that is driving this trade-off one way or the other. And this is exactly what we do. So let's specialize to this little model here, in which there is no heterogeneity when it comes to rich overlapping viewers versus exclusive ones, and let's specialize to a bivariate normal, to Q1, Q2 distributed according to a bivariate normal distribution, zero, one, parameterized by a correlation coefficient. Now, what this assumption here buys, it basically sterilizes the technology side, and I will talk a little bit about that later, if I have time. And so we're really looking here at relative elasticities, okay, in this exercise. We are interested in relative elasticity. So here is what you, here is what we do, here is what we get. So let me give you first the result and then let's try to build intuition. So in this particular parameterization of this model, the equilibrium outcome is pinned down by the sign of the correlation coefficient. Okay. So if there is positive correlation, then you get that competition uh, reduces the amount of ads. If there is negative correlation, as in the Fox News example at the beginning, then this model gives you that competition increases the amount of ads. A very stark prediction, how do we explain it? Okay, so this is the object of interest here. Now, you know, there is a strong intuition that if correlation goes up, there's gonna be a lot of overlapping guys, okay, then this is going to be that this duplication is gonna play a major role, and so you would expect, you know, the quantity of ads to go down. But the problem is that this is not sufficient. You also, if there is a lot of these overlapping guys, then it could be well the case that most of the variation comes from these guys at the margin. Let me, let me go on with this intuition. We're trying to understand why is it uh, that if correlation is positive, then all of a sudden in equilibrium there's gonna be fewer odds. This is the obvious effect, right? I mean, this is a normal distribution. I'm increasing the correlation parameter, and that's actually equivalent to shifting mass from the exclusive set to the overlapping set here, and vice versa, okay? That's actually something I was surprised. It's not a result you can get off the shelf. I mean, I had to prove it myself, but you know, it's sort of super intuitive that uh, these two things are equivalent. So D12 increases with rho um, is, uh, is, uh, is kind of very, very intuitive. Okay, so, well, if all people are here, they're getting lots of ads, marginal returns go down, boom. So what take, took me a lot of work instead was to show this other result, that the actual total elasticity decreases with rho, which means that the composition at the margin becomes also more averse as you increase the correlation. So this figure is saying, okay, before, when correlation is zero, high, before and after a discrete change in quantity, what this figure shows you is that here, after the increase in quantity, your inframarginal set is still balanced, okay? It's balanced before you increase quantity, it's still balanced. I mean, these are the guys in common over these guys here, and actually A plus B over C plus D is equal to B over D. Here, the point of this figure is to show you that here you end up, after increasing quantities, with just these overlapping guys which means that as you are increasing this quantity, you're losing the exclusive at the margin. Okay, so that's the intuition. How is this specific? Well, what I could do is to try and you know, understand which kind of feature of this normal distribution are driving this you know, very stark result, okay? And what I could show, paper and pencil, is that this elasticity here decreasing with correlation is equivalent to this bivariate distribution satisfying an increasing hazard rate condition, okay? Actually, you know, an off-the-shelf generalization of the increasing hazard rate condition. So, you know, I would expect 
this to be true for a larger family of distribution. Let me tell you why I like it. I mean, let's think, of, I mean, this allows me, this correlation allows to think about endogenous path functions, okay? So um, here's the exercise. So we're thinking about um, a two-stage game, okay? At stage zero, there is an entrant which has to decide which kind of content to provide, okay? Think about ideological diversity really works in this example, okay? So there is a Republican incumbent or a conservative incumbent, okay? So you have to decide whether you want to be conservative, liberal, or maybe do sports. Okay, question for Matt. Does this correlation coefficient captures exactly this kind of competition in this very large product space in a one-dimensional uh, parameter? Okay. So do you buy the premise of this exercise? I think it, you know, there is a sense in which this is a very, uh, you know, the more I think about it, the more it makes sense to think of um, product choice, especially when it comes to ideological diversity as choosing correlation. Okay, so here it means that if I'm differentiating, then I'm increasing diversity. Okay, that's the interpretation of this little exercise here. And, you know, there is going to be a cost. The way I like to think personally about this cost, you could think correlation equal to one means I'm basically duplicating the content of the incumbent and doing the same thing, right? If, if you know, those who like the incumbent, they like me. That's, you know, kind of an easy thing to do. It becomes more and more costly to move away from the incumbent, okay? Because I have to supply um, content, which is very different than the content that the incumbent is supplying. So there is a sense in which I like to think of this cost parameter, uh, this cost function as being some sort of a convex function um, uh, in the minus row uh, space, okay? But, you know, choose your own, choose your own. But that's just an interpretation. I mean, the point of this slide is, if you buy this sort of conceptual framework, then what do we learn about content? Okay. Now, in this model, we'll tell you, gee, you should totally choose a negative correlation coefficient because that's gonna reduce the overlap. Okay, so you're gonna make more money. Okay. Remember, decreasing correlation basically means keeping total demand constant more favorable inframarginal composition. These two things are equivalent in this model. So, you know, this paper tells you there is an extra incentive to differentiate, which is different than the hoteling incentive, that the, the incentive that is there in the literature, that pushes in the same direction. Move away from your rival, okay? There is another more subtle effect, which I call the strategic effect, which is akin to, you know, when we teach about competition on the hoteling line, we say, well, if you move closer to your rival, then it's gonna behave more aggressively, it's gonna lower prices. Where here, there is strategic interaction as well, and if you move away from your rival, he's gonna behave more aggressively in the sense that he's gonna do what MSNBC did, it's gonna increase the amount of ads. Now, if you buy this model, then the strategic effect could possibly go in the opposite direction and offset this incentive to differentiate. It's not possible to sign this unless, you know, you make functional form assumptions, but I mean, it's right there. Okay, so this is just the strategic um, incentive in this particular either both world, okay? Okay, so I'm almost done, so let me, um, just tell you that if, if you're interested in the paper, we sort of redo the exercise on the technology side. So we parameterize the curvature of these phi functions, and then we basically can pin down market outcomes to one parameter again, okay? And then we, we sort of discuss, again, why technology matters in this, and how technology matters in this world. And then we, um, and then we, we do a bunch of policy exercises. The point is, for instance, if you think about mergers, um, what we find with mergers is that it's not clear that a merger is gonna induce a, say, decrease, uh, or uh, sorry, an increase in the amount of ads. So if you're really concerned about, as many policymakers are, that there are too many ads on TV, then maybe a competition is not gonna solve the problem. Okay, so that's the punchline of the merger set. So conclusions, um, so I'm just saying, I'm advocating 
for just putting this word aside for a second and thinking more about business sharing considerations in setting like this one when you think this model is more appropriate than the other one, okay? Now, an interesting, so, you know, the, the follow-up question is, how are we really picking up anything uh, with this model? And in your paper, right, guys, um, so what Matt um, shows um, in this 2014 paper is that if you look at the historical newspaper market, so one thing that you could choose if you're interested over whether competition spurs diversity is um, whether we should think of the standard hoteling channel as being the main reason for why there is diversity in the marketplace or whether you know, business sharing is instead uh, the leading reason, okay? Again, in hoteling, you're trying to escape the price competition and that's why if there is a Republican incumbent, you choose to be Democrat. Here, you're trying to escape competition for the advertising dollars, okay? Now, what they find is actually, even in this setting, that they thought, you know, it's kind of a really bad application of this, you know, it's, it's it, you know, you would think that in newspapers, the independence assumption is a pretty strong one, but the, what, what you guys find is that, you know, a, on average, 86% of the customers of a newspaper, which is entering a market, are either new or shared. So basically, they find little business dealing. So what that means for what they do is that they can conclude that most of diversity can, can be explained by this business sharing consideration, okay? Um, we also have a wonderful empirical section. It's much better than this one, by the way. Uh, you will find it in the appendix. And, uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, can I, what can I extrapolate uh, from this paper, you know, thinking of, you know, competition at large. We're thinking about firms, okay, who, you know, um, really care about the composition of their customer base, and there could be other examples, and actually Glenn has a recent paper that sort of looks at uh, this composition effects on insurance markets. So in this paper, if you are increasing coverage, okay, as an insurer, what happens is that you're getting more risk averse people on board, these are very valuable, high willingness to pay, but on the other hand, you're also getting more sick people on board. So in that paper, it really matters what is the relative variation at the margin, which is exactly the kind of considerations we have in this paper.